This is the day that God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to each and to all this morning. Wherever you are at this very moment in life and location, you are welcome here. We are so glad that you have come to be part of this worshiping community at Emmanuel, and we hope that you'll help us get to know you. If you are a first time or returning visitor among us, Simply click on the link in your worship page to let us know how we can help connect you to the life of the church. As always, we encourage you to take a look at the announcements listed in your bulletin. There are also so many opportunities for ongoing small groups and community connection, and you are welcome to join small groups whether or not you've ever attended before. We invite you all to use the link on the worship page to sign for Emmanuel's weekly e-presence email newsletter. It's a great way to sh stay up to date on events in the community and prayer celebrations and concerns. I, for one, particularly love how to be, be an, how to be an anti-racist book club that's going through this July. If you're looking for a spiritual home right now, a place to ask questions, and a community with whom you can seek an experience of the holy and serve the God who is love, there is a place for you here. As we center ourselves and open our hearts to God in worship today. Remember that you can email your personal prayer concerns to us in the church office. You can also join us for sharing of celebrations and concerns in a small group on Zoom at 11 a.m. each Sunday. Just use the sign on link and password from your e-presence news newsletter. If you're new to a manual today, please, we hope that you join the Zoom and just email us at office.ipcmclean.org. With joy, let us worship God. Will you pray with me? Holy One, guide us into the worshiping hour now. Calm our minds from the concerns of the weak, still the anxieties of our hearts. Let us come to this time and place together with a spirit of vulnerability, allowing each of us to listen and engage and participate in a way that is exactly what we need today. Temper our fears, Holy One, but impassion our hearts. In your holy name we pray, amen.
maison J'ai trouvé ma place Je suis enfant de Dieu Je suis à lui begin a day when we speak in our hearts this is the day that God has made let us rejoice and be glad in it along with the psalmist what does that mean there is so much uncertainty right now swirling within us happening all around us and so may we heed the holy invitation to begin each day with the intention to live these precious lives seeking with God, justice and joy. Poet Mary Oliver puts it like this, hello sun in my face, hello you who made the morning and spread it over the fields. Watch now how I start the day in happiness, in kindness. This is the day that God has made. So as we work toward the day when God's kingdom of heaven is lived out fully on this good earth, may we seek for today to live with the intention of rejoicing, the intention of giving thanks on good days and on hard days, perhaps especially on those days when giving thanks and praise requires the Spirit's own help with open hearts, and the intention of opening our lives to the Spirit. Let us worship God. Amen. Our God, our helping ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, and our eternal join us in our prayer of approach and confession. O oh God, our Creator, let praise to you arise from every land and nation. Let your way of love, peace, and justice be our guide. Let Alleluia be our song. Let praise resound from shore to shore till suns shall rise and set no more. Even as we raise these joyous strains, Holy One, we acknowledge that our lives do not always line up with what we proclaim from our lips. You know well our fumblings and our frailties, our sins of commission and omission. But we bring them before you and ourselves in the silence of these moments, knowing that the first step towards new life is admitting that we need your help and grace. 
And so hear the sound of love poured out. O oh Lord, open our lips. And our mouths will declare your praise. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. Amen. Queen Vashti and King Ahasuerus. It's an Old Testament story from the book of Esther. Did you know that the book of Esther does not mention God even once? Not once. But I think you'll see God at work here. Did you also know that our Jewish friends also study the book of Esther? And they read the entire book aloud when they celebrate a special holiday called the Festival of Purim. I'll be playing Queen Vashti. And I will be playing her husband, the king. Here we go. Hey, Vashti, I need you to come dance for me and my friends. Uh, I'm good. What do you mean? I didn't ask you if you were good. I need you to come dance for me and my friends. No thanks. No thanks? What do you mean, no thanks? I told you I need you to come dance for me and my friends. Maybe later, but probably not. I am your husband. So that means I'm the boss of you. Well, I really only have one boss, and you know who that is. Come on, Vashti. Cut it out. If you don't do as I command, my friends will think I'm a loser. And... And your point is? If their wives hear about it, then they will stop obeying their husbands. Oh my, well that would be a big problem for you. Vashti, I command you to come and dance for me and my friends. You know, I would come and dance for you and your friends, but I'm tired. I've been dancing for you and your friends for a long time, and I don't want to do it anymore. I think it's time for me to make some big changes. Okay, Vashti, I'm giving you one more chance. I need you to come and dance for me and my friends. Or I will find a new queen. Okay, later, dude. The, the end. end. And that is the story of how one person's small act of saying no led to big changes in God's world. Listen to today's scripture and sermon to hear the rest of the story. But first, let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for the story of Vashti and her refusal. Help us to be brave when we need to say no. Amen. For all the saints who from their labors rest, who the before the world confess thy name, O Jesus, be forever blessed. Alleluia, alleluia. And when the strife is fierce, the warfare long steals on the ear the distant triumph song hearts are brave again and arms are strong Will you pray with me? 
beloved God, help us to hear your holy word. Open our minds to be ready to receive your wisdom, your comfort, and your truth. Help us to understand even when the understanding is difficult for us to process. Come with us into those spaces of discomfort and unease. Help us to have faith in your holy word. May we follow with better faithfulness, seeking your honor and love in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on the royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and ministers. The army of Persia and Medea and the nobles and governors of the provinces were all present. While he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. When these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the cit citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple to silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry, marble, mother of pearl, and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and royal wine was lavished according to the beauty of the the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons without restraint, but the king had given orders to all officials of his palace to do as each one desired. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women of the palace of King Ashwaras. On the seventh day, when the king was merry with wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti before the king, wearing the royal crown, in order to show the people and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. At this, the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. Then the king consulted the sages who knew the laws. Then Mimikin said in the presence of the king and the officials, not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to all the officials and all the peoples who are in the provinces of King Ashvers. For this deed of the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say, King Ashverus commanded Queen Vashti to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Medea, who have heard of the queen's behavior, will rebel against the king's officials, and there will be no end of contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him and let it be written among the laws of Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be altered, that Vashti is never again to come before the king Ashwaris, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, Emmanuel friends. I'm happy to be coming to you this morning from my home office slash art studio. This is probably the place that I have spent most of my time since the quarantine went into effect. This is where working from home happens for me, either here or in my backyard, as you may have seen on previous videos. But I'm very happy to be talking with you this morning about the story of Vashti's refusal. I hope that you enjoyed the children's sermon that Lee and Paulette Rainey delivered to you. And thank you, Lee and Paulette, for brushing up on your theatrical chops and presenting a, a mini version of Vashti and the King. And thank you to Liz, who read the scripture for us this morning. It's a very interesting scripture passage. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the book of Esther because you know the story of Queen Esther, who we see and, and our Jewish brothers and sisters see as the queen who saved her people, who saved the Jewish people. She, she used her position with the king and her love, of his love of her, to prevent the king's genocide of her people. A very important story in our faith history. But before there was Esther, there was Vashti. Vashti was the queen before Esther. So let's take a look at Vashti's 
story. It begins with a big party, a big, big, big party, one huge party lasting, the Bible says, 180 days, if you can imagine that. Now, of course, we know that the 180 days in the Bible is not necessarily the same as 180 days for us. But suffice it to say, it was a very long party in which the king invited all of the officials and ministers from Persia and Medea and the noblemen and governors and military leaders of that time. And so at the end of this grand, grand, grand party, the king decides to do what? Have another party, this time a little bit smaller. He has sort of a banquet that lasts for seven days. And he gives this banquet for all of the people in the citadel of Susa. And it says both great and small. Now this banquet was in the court of the garden of his palace. And in this area, the king showed off all of his magnificent belongings wonderful goblets and curtains and objects of art, a uh, really wonderful, wonderful display of his wealth. And drinking, it says, was done by the flagons and without restraint. At the same time, Queen Vashti, who we believe has been the queen for a few years and probably has a few children by the king, she is giving a banquet herself to the women. She is giving a banquet for the women in the palace, a different part of the palace from the king's banquet. So they were separated in some way, in some distance. And as it so happens, the king in his, we can say, I think safely, royal drunkenness sends for Vashti. He sends for Vashti to come and dance before him and all of the people who are there with him. We can call them his friends, perhaps other kings and officials, some noble persons, and perhaps some not so noble persons. And Vashti refuses. She refuses to come. And so then, as you heard in the scripture passage, what happens is that there ensues a conversation from the king and his ministers about what will happen if they let Vashti's refusal go without consequences. And one of his advisors says, well, of course, you know what's going to happen. Everyone will hear about this and word will get around to all the other ministers and noblemen and their wives that Vashti has refused the king and the other wives will begin to do the same thing. Well, of course, the ministers you know, let the king know that he should not let this happen. And that is when the king makes the decision that Vashti is no longer to be queen and that someone else will replace her. And that is when Esther comes in. Now, friends, even though the Bible doesn't tell us very much about Vashti, we can make some educated assumptions. And there have been theologians and scholars who have written about these educated assumptions and the ways that we might use our imaginations to think about Vashti. Some of this comes from the way in which other women in the Old Testament uh, were documented to have been treated. treated. So we can assume, we know that, that Vashti was a Persian queen. She probably had some children with the king and she had probably been the queen for a number of years. What we can very, very safely assume is that there was a great deal of focus on her appearance, on her beauty. We know that with Esther, there is a great deal of time spent making her over, getting her ready to audition for the king, to go before the king from everything from the way her nails looked to the way her hair shone to the way her skin smelled had to be just so. There was this intense focus on beauty and appearance, something even beyond objectification, I think we can safely say. So this is the place that Vashti is coming from when she refuses the king. We can also assume that this is not the first time that Vashti has been asked to dance for the king and for his comrades. She has probably been in this place before. And so 
she declines. She says no. I like to think of Vashti's refusal in the way that we think of the butterfly effect. Perhaps you've heard of this term, the butterfly effect. You may notice the quote in today's bulletin that says, a butterfly flutters its wings in Malaysia and that changes the air currents and causes a hurricane in Florida. Even one tiny action can create an enormous effect. And that is from Emma Scott, The Butterfly Project. Vashi's refusal leads to the king acquiring a new queen, and that is the queen who will go on to do something amazing. Now, if we think about Vashti, she probably knew what was at stake. And there she was, we can imagine, in the banquet hall with her women friends, perhaps with some of her attendants, and perhaps they were even present when the messenger delivered the message, the command for her to come and dance. I'd like to think that perhaps they would have rallied around Vashti and said, okay, Vashti, let us help you figure out how to respond to this request. And perhaps they would have known some of the challenges that she had faced being the queen of a king, and especially at this point, a king who was, I think it's safe to say, royally drunk. Do you think perhaps some of those women were in her corner saying, no, don't do it. You know what's going to happen, but it's not worth it. I like to think about that. I think like to think of Vashti's refusal as a community refusal coming from that group of her peers. And that is so often the case for small actions that we take. They can be informed by the support of our peers. When I think of small actions that could be happening in the world today, of course, I think of some of the small actions that we are all doing right now. The small action of wearing a mask, the small action of staying home, the small action of getting groceries delivered and not leaving the house. Those are small actions that we know have incredible consequences, incredible effects, incredible healing. And those are the ways in which we can own our usefulness in this kingdom of God during a time in which it seems as if we aren't useful at all. When I think of the stories from my own life about small actions having great consequences, there are a few that come to mind. One of you, all, some of you have heard me tell the story of my father who was a coal miner and probably would have been a coal miner until the day he died, except for there was one tipple foreman, and a tipple foreman is sort of, I don't know exactly how to explain it in technical terms, but he was a supervisor of, of a particular group of miners, and he was my father's supervisor, and he encouraged my father to take health and safety training classes. And my father took one, and then he took another, and he enjoyed it, and he took another and another, and eventually he took some college classes that were offered to him, and eventually he became a mining health and safety expert, and we moved to the Washington, D.C. area from the hills of eastern Kentucky. I think sometimes about that small suggestion, at least as it was told to me by my mother and my father's sisters, I think about that small suggestion and my father's action and the way that impacted the lives of me and my brothers, who might have spent most of our lives living in a coal mining camp, if it weren't for that. I think also about my childhood of growing up around people who used the N-word on a regular, almost daily basis. Um, and this was from my mother. And I believe the Holy Spirit was present in that situation from the get-go because even though I didn't know what that word meant, I knew by the time I was four or five years old, 
I knew that it was a word that caused a clench in my stomach. I knew it was a word I did not like, and it was a word I thought should not be said. And so throughout all of my childhood, I heard that word on a regular basis from my mother. And, I, and it was not just that word, it was whole lines of racist diatribe. And it was not until I became an adult and had children that I was able to say no to that word from my mother. It was the first time I had taken my son Sammy to visit my mother in Kentucky. My parents moved back to Kentucky after they retired. And I think I thought about the possibility that this might happen, that she might say that word in front of him. But I sort of hoped that it wouldn't. I thought, well, maybe she'll really understand um, that she should not be saying that word at all, and, and particularly in front of my, a child, any child. Um, but she did. She did say that word in front of him. And something welled up inside of me, perhaps the Holy Spirit, and I said, no. You cannot say that word if you want to have access to your grandson. And much to my mother's credit, she did not bat an eye. She did not respond in any negative way. And I never heard her say that word again in the presence of either of my sons, in the presence of anyone. I never heard her utter that word again. Now, she died a few years later. She died when Sammy was five. But there were opportunities and phone calls and times in which she might have said that word, but she never did in a way that I could hear it. I do not know if that had any effect on her or not, but I know it had a great effect on me to understand that I could stand up to that word. And the way in which it affected my life is that small action led me into a life where I would eventually become an anti-racist in the way that many of you are becoming anti-racist in the work that we've been doing at Emmanuel, the books that we've been reading, the conversations that we've been having. And it has also helped me to understand that being an anti-racist is not a stagnant thing. Uh, Ibram Kendi says in his book, it's something that we flow in and out of, racism and anti-racism, and that we are, is always at work in us, and that we are always at work in it. But it started with one single no. I also think about the quarantine, the pandemic that we are in right now. I think about the fact that we have been told at least that it started with one person eating infected meat from a wet market. It started with that one small action, that one small action that has led to global action of wearing of masks and staying home and learning how to pre-record a sermon and have church meetings on Zoom. I think historically too, I think about Martin Luther King taking that one action of nailing the theses to the door of the All Saints Church at Wittenberg. I think of Rosa Parks sitting in one bus seat. I think of the ways in which all of us throughout our lives are given the opportunities to take small actions that can lead to great consequences. And what I believe about those actions, friends, I believe that God is at work in those actions. Now, getting back to the book of Esther, the book of Esther is one of two books in the Bible, the other being Song, Song of Solomon, in which the word God, the name of God, any name for God is never mentioned. And there really isn't even very much spiritual that's mentioned in the book of Esther. There's really no essence of sacredness or there's no essence of the presence of God or anything divine. But friends, I want to believe that the Holy Spirit was present in Vashti. I want to believe that the Holy Spirit was leading her to that refusal. I want to believe that God and the Holy Spirit led Ibram Kendi. 
if you read his book, you will hear an initial story in which he is in third grade. He is in the third grade, third grade, probably eight years old. And he's in a classroom where there are a few black students and many more Caucasian students. And the teacher asks a question and he sees a little girl of color raise her hand shyly, quietly. And he notices that the teacher looks over and sees the little girl's colored hand and does not call on her, calls instead on a white student sitting at the front of the class. And this story of how Kendi begins his anti-racism journey ends with him staging as a third grader, a one person sit-in in the chapel after that incident in the classroom. He refuses to leave the school's chapel service because all along, this story has been working on his consciousness. He notices that the little black girl looks sad. He notices her downtrodden body language as they march to the chapel service. He notices how she is so quiet and doesn't seem to want to participate. And so when the teacher says to him and the rest of his class that it's time to leave the chapel service and all of the other students get up and line up to leave the service, Kendi sits and he refuses to move. A little eight-year-old boy refusing to move in the pew at the chapel. And the teacher says to him, come on, you have to go. And the teacher does not ask him what is upsetting him, does not ask him why he is sitting there and refusing to move. The teacher threatens him and says, I will call the principal in if you don't get up and come with the rest of the class. And he says, okay, go ahead, get the principal. And she does get the principal, the white teacher. The principal comes and the principal is, after some threats, punitive measures, able to have a conversation with Kendi about what he observed in the classroom. And she says to him that she will talk with the teacher about it. And that night, Kendi goes home and he talks with his mother about the situation. And his mother says, it's great if you're going to protest, but you are going to have to take consequences. Isn't that an amazing story for a little eight-year-old boy? I wonder, friends, how many of us would have been able to make that kind of decision to stand up to, and have the kind of refusal that Vashti had that small action. And I like to think that God was with him in that small action and that that small action was what led then to this book that we are all studying and becoming educated by and engaged with. A small action of a third grade boy, small action of a queen, small action of an adult grown woman standing up to her mother. I know many of you have stories like this. Many of you have stories of times in your life where you did something small that would have an amazing effect, something small that would build and accumulate and snowball into a wonderful, magical, wonderful consequence. And I pray, friends, that all of these consequences bear the mark of the Holy Spirit, that they work and they bring about wholeness and healing and God's kingdom and kingdom on earth. Amen. God of grace and God of glory, on thy people pour thy power, crown thine ancient churches. Assail his ways from the fears that.
that long have bound us free our hearts to faith and praise. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage for the living of these days. For the living of these days. Cure thy children's boring madness, bend our pride to thy control. Shame on our wanton selfish gladness, rich in things and poor in soul. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Lest we miss thy kingdom's goal. Save us from weak resignation to the evils we deplore. Let the gift of thy salvation be our glory evermore. Grant us wisdom, grant us courage, serving thee whom we adore, serving thee whom we adore. Will you pray with us? Holy One, you give us the power of refusal, the ability to resist, to say no, to walk away, or stay planted like trees by water. And so we give you thanks for those moments of holy conviction and holy decisions. Ruler and companion, you have entrusted us with crowns on our heads, positions of power, roles of authority, the strength of relationships. And yet we are so often unwilling to use those tools for your reign, unwilling to risk losing the comfort of palaces and coals to stack to interrupt systems of harm. Gift us with courage like Vashti, Holy One, so that we might be brave like she was brave, to speak truth, to listen, to walk alongside. Give us courage like hers to face the unknown in this moment, to care for ailing family members, to grieve and mourn, to make amends even across physical distance. And so we give thanks for her example, and we pray for our own leadership in the world, in this church for our ruling elders and our pastors and leaders in our state and our country. Be present for them as well, guiding God, gifting them with creativity and resolve in these times of transition and change. In all things, when we become the leaders you call us to be, or when we need that second helping of grace and new beginnings, we give you thanks for Jesus whose presence and love continues to lead us toward justice and joy for all creation. It is in his name that we work and pray together. Amen. Amen.
praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Please join me in our prayer of thanksgiving and dedication. Good and gracious God, we praise you for the ways that you work in this world. Thank you for the flutters, the butterfly wings. Thank you for being Emmanuel, God, with us. Thank you for your inspiration and motivation in our souls and in our minds. And so we pray now in the way that Jesus taught us to you, our neighbor and friend, our sibling and ally, our mother and our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for joining us in worship today, friends, and I hope that you will stay and listen to our very special postlude. And if you listen all the way in to the end of the postlude, you will have a very special treat. And now, friends, as you leave this worship space, know that God is Emmanuel, present with us in all actions, large and small, present with us in all that we do in this day. Amen.